to the class. So welcome everyone to this online conversation hosted by Move into the Future and the Wise Move Society, the online community for the over 50 or wise generation. This generation is growing rapidly. We're living longer, are longer healthy and active and are better educated than ever. There are many reasons why this generation should play a significant role in the economy and in society a lot longer than they expected when they started their career. So believe, we believe that the over 50 generation has a significant role to play in the creation of the future. We just need to tap into their knowledge, experience, and wisdom. With these Tuesday live conversations, we aim to give you a glimpse of what is happening online on the Wise Move Society to share a bit about both the challenges and opportuni op opportunities that the 50 plus generation is face facing, as well as how the members of the Wise Move Society work together to create the solutions and play an active role in society and in the economy. So the, the wise generation is very clear that we're not on our way out, but are part of the future. So for those of you who join us on Zoom, welcome. We love you to contribute to the conversation. Uh, if you want to do so, please show yourself on camera. If you've joined us on Facebook, welcome. Please share your feedback and questions in the comments. So my name is Ingun Boll, I'm the founder of Move Into The Future and the creator of the Wise Move Society. I'm here today with my co-host, Dr. Tatjana Rosen, and our two guests, Mrs. Jan Hively from the US and Mrs. Maura Allen from the beautiful city of Paris. <laughs> These two very special ladies are the founders of the Pass It On Network. So today we will talk about their mission to pass it on. So before we dive into this topic, I would like to give my co-host, Dr. Tatjana Rosen, the floor so she can share a bit more about her background and she will pass on the stage to Jen Amora. Thank you, Ingen. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, depending where you are. So I'm a psychologist and I'm a researcher as well. And my area of research is pretty much those transitions in midlife and beyond and what happens next and how can we make sure those transitions are positive and help us to thrive rather than get on our way in the future. So I'm really interested in, in the session today and I'm really curious to hear from you, Jan and Maura, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our conversation. So I will pass the mic uh, to, to Jan or to Maura and then to Jen. the session starts. Thank you, Jen. That's, that's on your hands now. And uh, Ingen has uh, suggested that we start by just telling a little bit about ourselves. So I'll do that in as few minutes as possible. Uh, at, at age 90, it kind of piles up those experiences. But I come from a background in uh, city and schools planning and administration, and mostly in Minnesota, in the state of Minnesota, USA. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been very focused on the topic of productivity of work uh, that benefits you or your family or the community uh, since the, the, early, the late 80s. Uh, and uh, that is because I think that we need to start early with life cycle uh, planning, uh, life work planning to teach productivity, which is learned uh, all the skills, habits, and attitudes learned in the home, in the, on the playing field, on the, in the workplace, etc. Because we're coming up to this time of the 100-year life and also a shortage as far as uh, uh, births in many, many, many countries. Uh, so uh, we need to be able to depend upon ourselves. And uh, we, I, I had started thinking about youth, working with youth during the 90s. But then I went to a conference when I was about 67. Uh, and uh, the person who was heading the conference, the state conference, said, uh, aging is our biggest problem. And uh, that is what captured me because... 
I was thinking about the productivity of older adults in rural communities, particularly from which the young people had left to go to the city, never came back, and uh, the uh, old people taking care of themselves, were, who are remarkably productive, doing whatever was needed in order to be able to care for themselves and each other, uh, and shifted my field. I received my PhD in that in the field of gerontology and. Uh, 2001 at the age of 69, and had the good fortune then after starting a couple of networks in Minnesota to meet Maura Allen at a conference in 2007, where we were both focused at the first positive aging conference on, on thinking about what we still are thinking about, a grassroots network of elders sharing innovative practices via the internet now in comparison to face-to-face -to -face then, to realize the potential for positive, productive aging lifelong. And I'm going to turn it over to Moira now to think about what, what has happened with us since that year. Moira, you're, you're muted, yes. There we are, I'm now unmuted, <laughs> thank you. So I'm very happy to see a fellow South African here, hello. <laughs> Um, I'm South African. I came to France in the late 70s and um, somehow or other I'm still here. So <laughs> it was supposed to be for two years, but I'm still here and I really enjoy it. My background is basically journalism, public relations and coaching. And I think I can sum up my journey by three words. The first is fear. The second is finding. And the third one is fulfillment. So the fear part came when I was coming up to that big 60 and um, I started chewing my fingernails and saying, how on earth am I going to look after myself going on if I retire? And I started searching around. I hadn't been in the French system sufficiently long to have accumulated a good pension. So I started looking and I went to the internet and lucky for me, I came across a site called Too Young to Retire which was just, you know, exactly down my alley. So I picked up my phone and was delighted to see that there was a telephone and found myself talking to Howard Stone, who'd started this organization in the beginning of the 2000s when nobody was really talking about retirement in the way we talk about it today. They were forerunners with Anko and uh, Mark Friedman, et cetera. They were really forerunners in this whole business. Anyway, um, he was running telephone courses on this and I took that and then he said, we've managed to piggyback the first ever positive aging conference and you must come. So I went and I met Jan there. She was running a workshop that was called Meaningful Work, Paid or Unpaid Through the Last Breath. And I thought, well, that has to be for me because I don't know how I'm gonna manage otherwise. And I stood in the queue after this wonderful workshop and gave her my little card. Um, I was running an occupational health organization at the time. And I said, if ever you come to Paris, look me up and we can have a big conference with all our occupational health doctors because they're not thinking about health and aging in the workplace just yet. So lo and behold, nine months later, I don't know if that's symbolic, Jan um, looked me up as she came to France. We did this huge big conference, which was a, real, a really great success and she went away. And then a year later, she came back and to attend a very big geriatric and gerontology conference where there were 6,000 delegates. And every day she came back looking glum. Hmm, what's the matter? She says, it's terrible. They treat us like packets. They want to send us places and pick us up and put us there. And it's just not on. So I said, well, what are we going to do about it? In the meantime, Janet introduced me to a very wonderful poem, which was written by a Hopi Indian leader. And I'm not going to read it, but just very briefly, he says to his people, you've been telling us that this is the 11th hour. I am now telling you that this is the 11th hour. And the river of change is flowing so fast and you mustn't be scared to leave the shore. You must get into the middle, go with the flow, go with the stream, be aware and certainly don't take yourself seriously. The time for being an individual is past. You must now collaborate, work with others and work together. And the last line was, we are the ones we have been waiting for. And that line has stayed with me forever. 
And it was what I learned at this positive aging conference, because I sat there and for the first time in my life, I came to, well, it was told to me and I realized it, that we can actually add or subtract, you know, up to 10 to 12 years of our lives through the way we live, through our lifestyles, through our mind, through our attitude, through our exercise. And this is really um, just so important. So, you can see from Jan um, what an absolutely lucky person I have been because she's become my deep friend, my mentor and my guide throughout this whole process because I'm, I'm not an academic as she is, but she's taught me so much and together we've collaborated beautifully and are still collaborate and still collaborate beautifully in building the Pass It On Network, which today has about uh, 90 liaisons in 66 different countries around the world with a couple of regional networks. And I've had the very best time since I retired. I've traveled the world for the Pasadon Network and met people in countries like uh, Japan, China, Australia. I've just come back from a wonderful meeting of URAG in, uh, in uh, Budapest, where we had a whole lot of people from Albania, from Lithuania, from uh, Hungary, where we were, of course, and the Czech Republic and Dan Denmark. And it's just such a stimulating life that, that we're leading. And what is so exciting is to meet people who think and feel exactly like we are. And um, this is, it's just so good, Ingen, to be with you and Tatiana, to, to know that you're basically doing the same kind of work. The, the task is enormous. There's space for all of us. and. All of us need to get to get involved. And Linda's doing such a wonderful job. And we all are, I think this is the best thing. We all, we're the army. We're the witnesses. We're the people who are standing there. And if we're all just aware of it, we can get rid of ageism by our way and by the way we're living. And I think that's just such an important thing. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I now go back to Ingen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Maura. Yeah, it's. The, I love the poem of the Hopi Indians, and actually, you know, I stole it from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Also from the uh, for the Female Wave of Change organization, you know, I, we had it on our website uh, uh, for many years already. And uh, uh, last week at the conference, I really quoted uh, out of that uh, because we are the ones. And whether we are women or whether we are absolutely elder generation, it doesn't matter. We, you know, we have to take responsibility and act, and that is uh, is so important. Jan, just wanted to comment on that. The fact is don't think about it ever as stealing because our whole our whole ethic of the Pass It On Network is we want to pass it on. Whatever you've got that's good, we want to be able to pass it on to others without boundaries uh, because Absolutely. you know that's what it's all about. We need to be leaders in creating a collaborative society. Yeah. Absolutely. And that collaboration is so important. And I think in the, the last week when we talked a little bit about what we were going to do, already shared, you know, people sometimes tell me is that there are more organizations, you know, there are more people working for this generation. I said, not enough. <laughs> exactly. Not enough. You know, we're still in a situation that I feel like I constantly have to explain myself and there is still so much work and there are still no solutions. And no great actions on, on how we are going to uh, uh, to find solutions for the challenges that, that we are facing and will be facing even more in the next coming years. So uh, so if you compare, you know, what what year was it that you started Pass It On Network? 2013. Yeah, but anyhow, you you <clears throat> You have been working with this this whole age group uh, many many years longer. What has changed? And I know that when you go to a conference where, where you bring all these people together, you feel like, oh wow, this is really fantastic. But what has really changed in those years? Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, the whole picture has changed because. In 2001, when I started my first network, which is called the Vital Aging Network, uh, it, it was the boomers are coming, the boomers are coming. 
And in that case, uh, these boomers now are between the ages of 55 and 75. And uh, they, they now are moving into that stage that we were so fearful about. Uh, but most of them, you know, still have their pensions, et cetera. What I'm afraid for is those who come after, along with those that we are more and more in touch with, thanks to, for example, Moira's wonderful organizing in Southern Africa, uh, and for also wonderful liaisons in India, for example. We're more and more in touch with the uh, people who are, are the women the, who have not had the education to be able to, you know, be, be here today, for example, they, they're not aware of, of uh, uh, the organization or, or the opportunities and trying to bring that to them, for example, through our experience incubator program, where they can understand that it doesn't matter if you don't have any education. There are people who make things work for themselves and others, and that to cultivate that leadership that can happen uh, and still that that's our task to spread it, to spread it around. Yes, wonderful. Moira, you're muted. Um, what, what strikes me particularly is the, um, the, the growing realization that you cannot plonk everybody from 60 and say they're elderly, you know, that's the, they're older. It's as much as putting a two-year-old child with a 22-year-old and saying it's the same thing, you know, it's just totally ridiculous. But on a, on a, stri a strictly um, practical point of view, I've been absolutely privileged to be um, part, part of this organization in France that's called Old Up. And they were started um, by people when, in, in their early 70s, 10, uh, 12 years ago now. And it's just been absolutely fascinating to watch because when they started, they had the, the, the core of their organization is to have groups that speak on specific subjects and they get to know each other very deeply. So when they started, they had, um, it's on all sorts of sub subjects, but they specifically have groups for, they started for 70 year olds they called it the second stage of retirement. And then as they went on, they started the Octa Plus for the 80-year-olds. They've now got one for the 90-year-olds. And I can assure you that each one of those groups is as different from the one to the other. Their commonalities, obviously, but their needs and their desires and their wishes are very, very different. And I think that that to me is one of the realizations in our society today that people are starting to do this. Even um, companies are now starting to, to, to be much more aware. So I think that there is um, a dawning you know, uh, uh, because of the sheer reality and strength and weight. We all know that the quickest, um, the biggest growing, fastest growing demographic group in the world is the plus 80s. Yeah. And the predictions for centenarians is really quite alarming, you know, when you see the number of centenarians. And when you look at this, I think the other realization is that people do not want to live the lives as older people that their parents, if they were alive, then, you know, like old age homes and been put away, they're not prepared to do that. They're prepared and wanting to, to, to build their own futures. And in order to do that, there are a whole lot of things that come into play. So I think there's a really big wake up that's going on around the world and our society is slowly is slowly waking up to the fact that you know the age friendly cities movement you can also talk about the age friendly universities movement which has grown grown radically I mean drastically and they're having a huge they're having their third conference which is coming up in November on this whole issue of aging and the silver economy so that's a, that's a very interesting point too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Moira and, and Jen. Uh, Tatiana, I want to invite you to join in the conversation. Thank you. I think that is, uh, it is very satisfying for me to be joining you, Jen and, and Moira here in this conversation on this topic, because this for me is, it's very important and it's been very important since I was in my 20s because for some reason as a 
as study psychology, everyone was studying childhood and I was interested in, in later life and the later stages. Mm -hmm. So all this shift and this increased attention I've been witnessing over the years as, as, as it's been growing and, and, and the realization, yes, we need age-friendly places, we need age-friendly cities, we need access to facilities to support so people can be independent and live a, a good life, a, a fulfilling life. Uh, the way that they, they want in their own terms. Um, and it's very easy to miss out the detail of what does it entail, this age-friendly environment, because we assume, as, as Maurice said, every over 50 is the same. And, and actually, there's more variation in later life than in childhood. It's easier to group two-year-olds than it is to group 50-year-olds because they are in that stage of development that the individuality is not fully fleshed there. So, uh, so I, I, I think that's, that's really interesting. I, I have a question to get the, continue the conversation going. What have you seen in terms of movement, in terms of age-friendly societies in the past, I don't know, 10 years? Jan, please. I, I, I'm about one of the... Uh founders of the, our age-friendly community, which was the second of, of its kind in Massachusetts. Uh, and I had originally been involved with the people in Geneva, Alex Kalachi, et cetera, uh, as they developed their first assessment, uh, which was uh, between the years of 2003 and 2007. Uh, and I, I, I see that the shift, thank God, is, is coming to think more about age friendly for all ages uh, and to develop an ecosystem, uh, an age friendly ecosystem, which is, goes beyond uh, the specific categories of housing, transportation, et cetera, those things that are basically government policies <clears throat> to have multi-general inter interaction. I don't think we're going to get rid of ageism until we begin at the beginning with life cycle education, which is kind of my whole thing. We have to think about the whole lifespan. And uh, that's exactly what I think that you have been implying in your, in your suggestion, Tatiana. Yes, I think that it is, it is a multi-generational issue. It's not, uh, we often have this conversation, I can see England is not, it is not, an issue that's only for one group to solve it is a the whole society that needs to come together. So there's space for participation of all age groups. So young people don't feel marginalized as well as older people don't feel marginalized, but they actually feel welcome and, and, and have a space to contribute. So it's, it's interesting, I think, because we began by talking about the importance of having recognizing the distinction, whether you're not in your 90s or your 80s or your 70s, etc. cetera, the diversity grows as you grow older. <clears throat> but at the same time, as we're thinking about those specific differences, we also need to be thinking about making sure that all of us are understanding those differences beginning at the beginning and what's, what's most important to hold on to, which is working together. We, we had such a fabulous, or we are having such a fabulous time at the Pastor Network with um, some interns that we've been working with. And um, we've had three so far, and it's been such a wonderful, um, they've taught us so much, you know, in the whole field of social media and communication and strategy. They had a look at our stuff and said, you know, wake up, guys. <laughs> and did quite a strict um, strategy uh, report on, on us, and we took it to heart. But what was very, very satisfying was that we gave them um, a graph, uh, a sort of graph when they came in with different points. And then, um, you know, so, uh, they had to mark on a scale of 10 their knowledge about, uh, about ageism, about age aging, you know, about eight points. And then we did that when they left and we saw a, a marked um, increase in their knowledge. But the first girl who came along, she was at Brown College in Toronto. And she was studying um, youth development. 
And at the end of her at the end of her internship with us, she decided to ask Ryerson University to add gerontology to her curriculum. And I think that that girl will be changed for the rest of her life. And that is so so very interesting. And then the, um, uh, Tash Miller, the, from who, who was with us right now, she's decided to do her dissertation on aging. So that's what Jan's also talking about, you know, getting right home to people because that will change them for the rest of their lives. They will have a totally different um, notion and optic about it. So that's been very, very satisfying, I must say. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to involve Linda in the conversation. Linda actually is the one uh, who introduced me to uh, to Jen and Moira and the Pastel Network. So, uh, Linda, I know you know this is also your line of business. So, uh, <laughs> please uh, comment on what you see happening, or the, you know the ask the next question. The floor is yours. Sure. I uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Ingen. Um, yeah, I think the Pass It On Network and the baton of leadership um, is such an important thing, whether you're young or old. But um, for me personally, um, when I started this work in South Africa in 2005, there was um, no one as a thought leader that I could refer to locally. And soon after that, Moira and I connected. Um, and I'm eternally grateful to Jan and Moira for the education over the last 10 years, um, because we learn from one another and culturally, and um, it's diverse in different parts of the world. Um, and so as Moira and Jan have said, you know, it's there, there is so much work to do intergenerationally and within this older and younger old, as we, we kind of all, you know, it's such a big change. So I just want to, uh, the reason I came onto this call is because these two are my heroes. Um, they are the people who have helped me to, to stand on the shoulders of giants. So I just, I am just here just to commend both of them and oh, you and you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Oh. <laughs> It's fantastic, you know, and, and it's true. You know, we can learn so much and that is also the, you have to pass it on. That is what you're passing on. So that's uh, fantastic. Uh, we have some, uh, also some participants here, Deborah, Francis, Mary Jane, Pam, and someone, I'm not sure what the name is. So uh, anyone who wants to jump in and ask a question or comment. Um I'm very pleased to see that South Africans are dominating today for a day. <laughs> um, one thing I have to point out, Linda's brought it up. South Africa in particular is a very young society. In South Africa, to be old is to be finished. Um, but not only because they see people as old, but because they see older people as taking away their opportunities. So it's, 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 a, it's a double problem. So if you give an older person a job, it means a younger person who's unemployed, we've got something like 6 million unemployed young people. So you give an older person a job, it means one young person who's starting their lives doesn't get that opportunity. So, so we have an extra problem here. And in a country where there's so much poverty and so much unemployment, it's really, really difficult to be motivated as an older person. And I'm very grateful. I never realized, you know, I was thinking about this a while back. I used to give motivation speeches when I was in my 50s. In fact, I went to an old age home once. I didn't realize they were old. I prepared this Four Faces of Eve. I got them so motivated. The, the, the husbands phoned me the next day and they said, you got my wife and my, 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 my sister worked up. What am I going to do with them now? But I didn't realize, and I lost it in the meantime. When I turned 70, I lost it. And I was on my way out. And I didn't realize the power of what you guys are doing. What you guys are doing, bringing people together, doing the social grouping, and just talking is so powerful. Because we have the tools, we have the brain, we have everything. What we lack 
is the conviction and the perspective. And, and, and that for me is, I mean, it's worth gold. So I'm very grateful that I got to this group and it's amazing how many things are changing. Yesterday, they appointed me as a chairman of my corporate, of the body corporate in this complex. Last year, I would never have accepted. <laughs> um, you know, it's just amazing how things just work, you know, just with this. So, Jan, I, I salute you. I mean, I thought 71 was old. You have now made me feel like a spring chicken. Yeah. So I'm I, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and my partner is 78. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of ways of having differences here. <laughs> Recognizing those differences. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think that um, what you're saying is important, except for one thing. And that had to do with older people need to let go of their, their work because the younger people want to need the jobs. And I, I do want to tell you that there's some pretty good research that shows that the pool expands when the older people stick around, perhaps not in the same jobs, however, more in phased retirement or more in uh, 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 you know, shifting their, their, what they're doing. Uh, there's been some very interesting work, for example, in Germany, where manufacturing plants are taking account of older workers because they really need those there. And they are changing the footwear. They're changing the floors. They're uh, 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 having people do different jobs during the day. Uh, they're having, uh, they're uh, 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 putting in uh, uh, stools, for example, uh, for the people to be able to sit as they're working. These things, these new technologies actually help everybody. And I, you know, I, I do think that we need to see what, how do we need to prepare our young people so that they will be entrepreneurial developing new ways of doing things and participating in their in the employment. And uh, that is, I think, the reason why I'm, my primary interest is in changing the educational systems from the get-go, from early childhood development up through higher education to allow in and out uh, uh, skills training, courses, uh, certificates, so that we don't have to just think about masters and PhDs anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we can think about uh, what you need at the time that you need it and experience learning, experiential learning. So that's mm -hmm. my spiel, sorry. But, but Jan, just in, you know, in going on from that, I think we've got a really wonderful example in our Pastor Network in Southern Africa, where Christine Crossley, who's one of our liaisons, who belongs to Meals on Wheels, She's, she's like all of us, you know, she's got a very big heart and been very worried about the um, unemployment, which has been exacerbated by COVID, as you can well imagine. So she came up with the idea of um, finding sponsors to sponsor a course to train people to become manicurists. And this was over a whole period of a week. And she got, she found the money, she found the teachers, she got them all together. She even got these people, she said that this was a group of people that had never been, never, hadn't, hadn't been able to finish their education. So they'd never sort of graduated to anything. Right. And she went to the extent of finding them gowns with the mortarboard, is that what you call them? For graduation. Mortarboards. And huh? the, yeah, at the end of the, at the end of the course, these people graduated and she said, you cannot explain what the feeling that you got from that. They really felt that they were worth something and that they had gained something. And then from that, she's going to try to get teachers, uh, trainers out of that group to train other manicurists so that they can try and um, you, you know, make a living that way. So the older people uh, can can play also you know a different role. I totally take your point, Francis, that we don't want to take um, young people's jobs, but maybe we can multiply some jobs. And I think that uh, Christine Crossley's example is really a, an outstanding example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, wait, because I know, I think Pam was first, uh, ladies. Okay. I'll get there, Deborah and Mary Jane. So, Pam. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to say, Jan and Maura, how inspired I am to hear <laughs> of what you've done. And you, you say your ages. And well, Jan, I, Moira, I have no idea how old you are, and it doesn't matter. But it's <laughs> it's just remarkable to see you, Jan, at 90. So, so passionate and, and hearing how involved you are. It's, it's, it is totally inspiring. And it's really interesting because I just turned 69 and I do not feel old. And I really have had my own businesses since the early 90s. And when I moved to Victoria, I live in on the west coast of western part of Canada. I joined several newcomers groups and everyone was retired. And some of them are like in their 50s and they're like playing golf and, and meeting for tea but they're not really doing anything meaningful. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I mean, they're nice people, but I feel like I don't have anything, a lot in common, you know? And so it, I think it's, it's great. It's, it's so great that you have the Pass It On Network and Linda, it sounds like you're doing amazing work in South Africa and likewise, Ingrid Finding the Wise Move, because there is a real need for people like us to get together. And there is such, um, such a, I would say there's just so much knowledge and experience and so many skills and, and furthering this idea of, I think it's very real, this idea like Francis raised about younger people thinking that we're stealing their jobs if we stay. Uh, I used to work in international health and development and consult with governments in different countries. And I remember somebody talking, there was a woman who was 73 at the time, and I was a fair bit younger, and him saying, he was like in his early 40s, you know, it's, it's really not right that she's here, she's taken away a job from someone younger. Anyway, I feel like the idea of mentoring, but paid mentoring, is something that we haven't explored wow. enough, and I feel like in organizations, rather than stealing jobs, looking at how you could create mentoring positions at all different levels in PR and communications and whatever it is, right? And have that opportunity for people to have, it could be one-on-one -on -one mentoring or it could be group. It's probably more cost-effective to have group mentoring. So people could share their skills and learn from these people. And because at a certain age, like there's certain things you don't wanna do. Like I'm at the point, I've done so much hands-on stuff and creating stuff, it's like, yeah, I'll help you create it, facilitate it, and then I'm going to hand it off. So I feel like there's there's so much that we can do. You want to do stuff that you really enjoy doing when you reach a certain age. You just don't want to be doing all that stuff you did when you were younger. Sure. So really, there's, there's, I think, a need to look at, you know, how do you, if you get people into mentoring positions, how do you assess not only their skill sets, but also where their passions lie and utilize only the areas they're passionate about, not just the stuff they're good at, because we know that passion and being good at things are not necessarily the same thing. There's an intersect usually, nice. but anyway. And the other piece I'd just like to raise is that I've been fascinated by aging at a very young age. I almost did a PhD in transcultural or cross-cultural aging mm -hmm. because I was really interested I'm going to say in the 90s, maybe, in, um, in looking at aging in different cultures, because we know, you know, in indigenous cultures, the elders are really revered, and they're looked after in the shamans, you know, the medicine people in different cultures, you know, and a lot of times it's women, and a lot of, there's sometimes men, but a lot of times women, and I feel like there's much to learn. So I'm wondering, um, Moira, Jan, and Linda, have you are you aware of some cross-cultural work that's being done in looking at aging in different cultures and how we, we can learn and share from one another cult cross-culturally? Because I think there's much to learn and share. Well, I think, um, you, you know, I think it would be very interesting, Inge, if we talk to Siri Jackson, who's here from, uh, from Finland, and she's done some wonderful intergenerational, um, sorry, cross cross cultural work in in the field of of dementia. And let uh, Siri tell us what you've been up to. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I have to say that I also love you too <laughs> very much. Um, I remember my first uh, uh, when I met uh, Moira in Helsinki, and she said that I am just baby yet. <laughs> in Tassita Network. So I'm continued to be the baby here. <laughs> um, uh, I'm 54. And I also feel that I'm like 
somehow, some way, I'm middle of uh, uh, young people, and I'm not old, I'm not young, and I'm not in every issue, so I'm not suitable to be for a work, for example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in, uh, in, in Finland, I have been working uh, a lot uh, with um, elderly migrants uh, uh, and um, mm -hmm. uh, their brain health, to educate them about brain health and dementia issues. And uh, there is a lot of different uh, hmm, point of views uh, how to how to be old how to be old uh, what does it mean to be old it's it's so different in different countries in different languages um, i don't know estonians are young forever <laughs> but for example there are some some different groups uh, here in finland who um, who decided that uh, when you as a woman, you cannot have babies anymore. That means that you are old. Oh. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. Uh, but I I want to raise one more um, thing. Um, uh, I write the uh, wrote the um, um, project, and I don't know. Do I have? To, do we get? Uh, some um, some foundation or not, but uh, I I tried to cross cultural um, project where was uh, uh, the idea was that the youngest um, members of the community will um, learn, uh, to help uh, elderly loneliness and uh, they will talk. Uh, during Corona time, where nothing is open, very very long time, so we'll see how it goes. But I want to raise that it's it's easy to think uh, very good ideas, but it usually stops uh, when you don't have any money. So so you have to have all the time the make uh, and write uh, different projects and nobody knows do you get money or not and um, it's difficult to work all the time by volunteering so mm. this is only me <laughs> i i cannot do everything by myself and it's hard to find also um, other other people who are the same ideas have the same ideas mm. so yeah I don't know. I, I think we all, all those groups, we all have a lot of ideas, very great uh, experiences, but somehow we have to make them together because together is easier to, to get some foundation from EU or, or I don't know, World mm -hmm. Health Organizations. Yeah. So yeah, Okay. that was my idea. <laughs> yeah. I know this is some of the well. First of all, that 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 cross cultural is very interesting. I think we need to schedule another hour on that because that's a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, knowledge about that as well uh, about funding. Uh, I think you know Tatiana when we talked about is one of the first times he said, well, you know, there's so much money for research, but now we need money for action. That's right. And I think that there's a whole appetite now to have more practical solutions. Of course, research is, is great, raise awareness, raise the issue, but actually acting on the community, especially here in the UK, is becoming a bit more pressing. So uh, the, 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 uh, the, the fund holders are keen at that projects have a, a real impact in communities and real, make a real difference for the people they are living there and i can see some hands going up so I'll, I'll let you jump in right tatiana i would like to know if you as a researcher would not like to consider a project and using citizen scientists using us all as your collectors of information on the ground 
<laughs> I love <laughs> that. Uh, Maura, that is that is a, a, a fantastic uh, approach. I was in a conference, well, before COVID, I went to a conference and I saw a paper about um, toilets, public toilets. And, and it was a very interesting paper because I never thought about it myself. <laughs> and the whole research was done exactly of all community participants taking pictures as they went along and, and talking to the researchers and exchanging those ideas and the richness of the findings were way, way better than if someone sits in an ivory tower in an office in a university researching the topic. So uh, I would be delighted to talk more you about know, that. Um, <laughs> the, the person that, that really sparked me off about this is Tina Biffle, who's at the Manchester University. I don't know if you know of her at all. But she, she was asked, or well, her university was asked by the city of Manchester to, to research the whole issue of age-friendly cities. So Tina must have been about 35, 40, and she said, well, I'm not the right age to do this. Mm -hmm. And she recruited seniors and trained them, and she said they were, it took a long time. She said it was very really time-consuming, but that they were extremely um, conscientious and they were very well accepted in the community because they went back into their communities. So the, the, so the effects and the information that was brought out from them was extremely, it was, was very good. You know, and I think that's such, you know, the, the whole, the, everything's changing. And how can people know what's going on because they're not in our skins? Mm -hmm. We're in our own skins and we can <laughs> tell you what's going on. Yeah. Just one they, I, oh, Jandy, did you want to respond on it? Because I have two more questions or comments, and I'm looking at the time. Did you did you want to jump in, uh, Jan? Yeah, just one one second. I, I just think that uh, you need to know that Moira and I have done this as volunteers. That there's been no no budget. We don't even have a budget. Uh, uh, and we've taken out of our pockets, uh, basically, for the web web designer. And there are people who should have been paid but haven't been along the way. Uh, so, we, but we recognize the problem of not having any money. That's for sure. Uh, however, this is the point: we've been able to get these these you know hundreds of people involved for nothing, mm -hmm. thanks to the internet. Everything we do is on the internet and it's free. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, think of that uh, as far as the capacity for research with citizen mm -hmm. scientists around the world. We could help. Mm -hmm. Volunteer. Okay. Volunteer. <laughs> well, maybe if there is enough money for that research, they, they can. Yes. Right. Just give something, yeah, Oh, that's food for thought there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Deborah. Oh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. I was just going to say that, um, oh, I'm sorry. I have to leave because I have to teach. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm just so excited to see Jan and Moira, how, how eloquent you are in your expressions. And you are really an inspiration for, for people to look at and say, when I'm passionate about something, you know, I, I can do anything. And, and you were talking, Jen, about education, uh, teaching people skills when they're you know, very young. But what we're not teaching people is to be self-sufficient and to, to, to take up what's passionate for them from when they're very young to nurture that so that they can go out and do it on their own and build their own company. So it's not really anything about entrepreneurship, which I think is so missing in our, in our world. Because I'm seeing people now who are ready to retire or thinking about retiring, who want to now do what's, what is, What's their gift? What's their talent? What's their passion? What fires them up? Because life has got its hurdles. And so we have to have something that it, we can use as, um, as our sort of chalice to keep us going because there's going to be hurdles. So it has to be passion. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's so lovely to see more and more of people in, in our era 
<laughs> light up, light up and, and remain also remain youthful. So kudos to you. What you're doing is phenomenal. Yeah. Deborah, by the way, she's, uh, she's the, our yoga teacher on the Wise Moon Society. So uh, really happy. Right. That <laughs> I see you have to leave. So it's, yeah. you know, see you next time. Yes, Mary right. Jane. Oh, no, I was waving goodbye, but I... Oh, bye, Mary Jane. <laughs> bye, Tatiana. Bye, Francis. <laughs> fellow Canadian, fellow Canadian. Um, yeah, I, the only point that I'm going to make at this one is something that might interest you if you're not aware of, of this organization. Um, I saw an article recently about them, and I just looked them up online. But the Care Center Humanitas in Daventer, which is a nursing home, and has 30 students living in um, in their own separate private accommodations, but they take care of um, and, and support two or three or four uh, of the residents that are living there um, by doing some cleaning. They have to do something like 30 hours a week, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to uh, provide 30 hours of volunteer work for the, for the residents that are living there. But this intergenerational aspect, this, I thought this is such a beautiful thing. So Care Center Humanitas in Daventer in the Netherlands. Yes, where are yeah. Thank you. Yes. Care Center Humanitas. Yeah. Yeah. Daventer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Jane. And by the way, Mary Jane did a great presentation uh, today <laughs> on the Amplify uh, Day uh, <laughs> conference. And, uh, you know, there was... Why is my society? Why is my society? Why, why? Well, really loved it. So anyhow, <laughs> I, got, I, got us, I got a plug in there for us. Yeah. I, I would like to do a, a, a quick tour, um, starting with Jen and Moira, and asking everyone, give everyone the opportunity, what do we have to pass on? Jen. Passionate, passionate uh, engagement. And the power of engagement. Wow, nice. Moira? Lighting the spark in everyone. Lighting the spark. Great, who's next? Who's next? What are we going to pass <laughs> Yeah, passion was the word that I came up with, Ingen, as well as Jan, but I, that was the first word that popped in my head. What do we need passion, you know? Um, so I second that, Jan. Okay. I'm okay. going to be more, more specific. I'm going to say facilitation skills and creative leadership. Hmm. Uh, I think tactics for me, tactics, how to get things done. Yeah. How to commercialize my knowledge. Um, that's, Process. that's what I'm struggling with, you know? How do I commercialize my knowledge without beating people over the head to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but basically, how to entice people to buy what I have to sell without selling it? It's, it's, I think that's quite a skill that I'm, I haven't got. Not yet. Not yet. I'm getting there. When you do, tell us. <laughs> to, sell it to us. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's a beautiful name, but I have no idea how to pronounce it. It's easy. Siri. It's easy from iPhone. Oh Siri. Oh, okay, I can approach. But then he starts talking back at hey, me. Hey Siri. <laughs> well, hey, Siri. I think also that passion is uh, the the key word, but also joy, determination. That um, we we have to go to the goal. We have to find the goal and go for for the goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Tatiana. Oh, for me, I, I want to, to borrow, borrow is the word, isn't it? All of yours, plus I will add, pass on curiosity and resilience. Oh, right. 
Yeah, well, um, yeah, for me, it is uh, knowledge, experience and wisdom. Uh, I think that is, uh, it's, it's, it's very important. Okay, so Tatiana, I would like you to ask to wrap it up and maybe summarize, reflect what we've seen, what we've heard. Well, I have to say that today on this conversation, I wrote pages and pages of notes that we've been talking, oh, loose words here. But I will summarize this, when there's a will, there's a way. And when there's a desire to engage, we can get together and engage. And I think the conversation is much deeper than that. But the spirit is, is getting together and, and creating a shift in society. So thank you, Jan. Thank you, Maura. Francis, Mary Jane, Pam, Siri. And above all, thank you, Ingen, for yes. promoting this conversation because it was a wonderful conversation. Yes. Time thank flew by. Thank you very much uh, for me as well, uh, ladies. And uh, next week, I'm not going to be there, but Tatiana is going to lead a wonderful conversation. Can you share a little bit uh, about it? Oh, next week we have a, a, a colleague. That's a, um, she's a coach. She works and believes on self-belief in later life and her herself make big changes in careers. And she's in her mid-60s, yes, just starting her PhD and starting a new big role. And she will share with us why it's important to have self-belief, even though we might all doubt ourselves <laughs> from time to time, as we notice in our email conversations. But there you are, we'll be talking about that and hopefully have a bit of fun with the topic as well. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much, ladies, for sharing your wisdom. And uh, well, let's talk soon. Yeah. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Tatiana, Francis, Mary Jane, Siri, lovely to see you, and Pamela. Thank you. I wish that we could see each other in person now. We wouldn't have met without the internet. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh.